How wonderful. Yeah, how wonderful. Hi, welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and the show has been nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award, and we've been doing this for 14 years. Obviously, something's going right in our world that we do, and I do love the conversation and who I get to meet by virtue of the show. Curious mind, and I hope you do too, because today is going to prove to be yet another one of those conversations. We're going to be talking about close encounter news on UFOs, un unidentified aerial phenomena, extraterrestrial life, and space. So you'll want to be here for my guest today, and the show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. If you'd like to take a class, become a facilitator, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R dot com, as well as Access Consciousness. Dot com. I myself am a book writing coach. I help coaches, entrepreneurs, and speakers take the time effective action steps to write a highly engaging book. And I do this through my classes. And there are openings right now if you'd like to join debbie-shinger.com slash visible visionaries, as well as private sessions. And I also show you how to book podcast guest interviews so you can increase your visibility and get massive results. I've got a free gift for you if you'd like to learn how to do these things and become more visible by writing books and by being interviewed, go to debbie-shinger.com slash gift. It's D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R slash gift. My guest today is Stephen Bassett, who's a political activist, disclosure advocate, and the executive director of Paradigm Research Group, founded in 1996 to end the government-imposed embargo on the truth behind extraterrestrial-related phenomena. Stephen has spoken to audiences around the world about the implications of disclosure, the formal confirmation by heads of state of an extraterrestrial presence engaging the human race. He has given more than 1,200 radio and television interviews on the political implications of the UAP ET phenomena. PRG's advocacy work has been extensively covered by major national and international media. In 2013, PRG conducted a citizen hearing on disclosure at the National Press Club in Washington, DC. In 2014, PRG launched a two-year political initiative that injected the ET issue into the 2016 presidential campaign. PRG recently launched the new exopolitical podcast called Disclosure wire. And if you'd like to learn more about my guest, go to paradigmresearchgroup.org. And with that, I welcome Stephen to the Dare to Dream show. I am so excited to have you here. I'm daring. I'm dreaming. That's beautiful. You're in the right place, right person. Oh my, we are now friends. We, we just had the most amazing bonding experience for which I'm grateful because I really have been excited to have this conversation with you. And I'm one of those interesting people, if you will, because I came from being one of those skeptics, one of those fear-based people, and I had an awakening a couple of years ago. And all of a sudden, I knew what I was hearing was truth. Like I had my own disclosure. And so now my hunger for this information is unending. So thank you for being here. I want to start with you are a lobbyist. You tirelessly work, and I'm very humbled by all that I read and researched about you. You tirelessly work to confront the U.S. government on the existence of extraterrestrials and their presence here on Earth. What for you are the latest? What are the key evidence about the existence and the presence of, I would like to call them celestial beings, uh, but also known as extraterrestrials? Well, extraterrestrials um, could mean a lot of different things, but the common usage now uh, for, for most people is uh, beings from other than the planet 
They, they, they're from somewhere else, almost certainly other planets. So that's the common use. One, one can get into some interdimensionals and ultra terrestrials and angels and things like that, which technically would also be extraterrestrial. But in terms of the basic use of the term now in the news and in the public domain, it refers to non-humans that have spacecraft that can do things that we can't do. As far as the evidence, the evidence is overwhelming. And uh, we knew about the presence of extraterrestrials no later than 1947, uh, because Roswell was in fact a crash vehicle and it did contain non-human bodies. And the government of course has known that ever since. Uh, there's some wonderful evidence for extraterrestrials engaging us going back thousands of years. Uh, for those of you that have watched all 192 uh, episodes of Ancient Aliens, you're familiar with this. Uh, I happen to love the show and I've been on it a few times and I believe that Ancient Aliens, there's a lot in there that will prove to be correct. Not all of it. But since we know that extraterrestrials are here in the modern era, 47 forward, it shouldn't shock anybody that they might have been here before then. And so when, once, you, once you've accepted the reality of ETs in the modern world, it's a lot easier to go back and watch ancient, alien, ancient aliens and go, oh, that's interesting and that's interesting. Now, to those that don't even think ETs are here now, given all the evidence we have, well, ancient aliens just simply drives them right up the wall and they hate it and they can't stand it. And if they're an archeologist, they just start ripping their hair out. Um, and that's too bad, what can I say? So extraterrestrial is kind of a big deal but it's a really big deal now because we're not Egypt of uh, 2000, 3000 years ago. We're not uh, Gobek, Bekley Tepley. Uh, we're not uh, any of the ancient civilizations. We are a fully global civilization with high technology, mass global communication, and we're space fair. In other words, we're, we're pretty hot stuff right now. Uh, and we are a global civilization. So, the fact that ETs are engaging us now and engaging us in the way that they are, as opposed to the way they, they, they may have in the ancient past is quite significant. And it is that significance, which I think we could lay in the area of exopolitics or exogeopolitics, where my interest lies. Uh, I've never seen an ET and if I never do, I'll be okay. Um, uh, and I'm not doing this because ETs are fantastic or anything. I do my work because the implications of the extraterrestrial presence for the uh, circumstances that the human race faces right now are just off the charts. And we should be addressing those implications in every university in the country. Uh, commentators and pundits should be talking about it all the time and all the major networks. There should be major documentary films in all the theaters and so forth, but we're not. And so what someone say, well, look, if it really has huge implications and none of that is happening, why? And the answer for that is truth embargo. Uh, and that's when things get interesting. This is a term that I coined back around 2000. And it is coined for a very important reason. Uh, activism to succeed needs to be uh, accurate in its language. If you, uh, and, and, and by the way, activism is all about finding the, the, the language that reflects the truth and countering the language of the authorities, which invariably does not reflect the truth. In other words, they're lying, you're trying to tell the truth. And so, but if you're an activist and you decide to play fast and loose with the truth, then essentially you're literally going against the fundamental premise of what you're trying to do. So, the, so we, in, in this field for, Decades, we were calling it the UFO cover-up. And UFO is an awful term to begin with, and it wasn't a cover-up. It was a national security policy. It was completely legal. So that you need to call it something else. And so rather than call it a cover-up, call it a truth embargo. And that's more reflective of uh, what it is. And also doesn't criminalize the people inside government that are carrying out this legal national security policy. So the truth embargo, what is it? It is the formal policy of the United States government withholding confirmation of the ET presence, which they've known about since at least 47 from us. It's a policy of dissuading entities, organizations and institutions and NGOs from kind of getting involved in it, uh, particularly colleges and universities. 
It involves a little undermining of research, a little misdirection, some sleight of hand, and so forth. It's a very, very intense, well-funded policy that has gone on for 75 years. And the reason it has gone on so long is that normally this kind of thing is, is done under strict authoritarian governments. In other words, they don't want you to, to think some, about something or certainly speak about something or give them a hard time about something. And so what they do is when you do that is they take you out behind a building and they shoot you in the back of the head. And so problem solved. Now the problem that they have is that authoritarian countries like that burn out, right? They, they collapse under the weight of their, of their immoral vileness. We are not an authoritarian country. We're a, a constitutional republic. We are a democracy of sorts. And so we don't do that. And so in order to maintain the truth embargo, we've got to do other things. And because we are a viable country, we haven't burned out. We're still here 75 years later. And so the truth embargo that I'm engaging as an activist and all my colleagues are engaging and all the researchers are engaging and the podcasters are engaging, et cetera, et cetera, and the documentaries, let's don't forget them, is unprecedented in human history. It's never happened before. Nothing like this has ever happened before. If you were to examine every major political activist movement going all the way back to you know, the foundation of, of the Middle East and uh, China and everything else, you probably cannot find an activist movement in which a very big issue was in play. Large numbers of people were trying to convince the government that this is what has to happen. And the government's response to them was, what are you talking about? All right, what are you talking about? Think about this for a second. Imagine if a bunch of civil rights leaders back in 1950 had gone to the White House uh, pressing to get a Civil Rights Act passed so they could end segregation in the South. I mean, end, end, uh, yeah, segregation in the South. And spokespeople for the president came out and said, what are you talking about? And they were going, what do you mean? You're talking about what segregation in the South? There, there's no segregation in the South. Oh yes, there is. Oh no, there's not. You're, 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 you've been misled, confused. Mm. You're crazy. You're a kook. Just imagine that. Can you have any people would say that's absolutely ridiculous? I can give you other examples, right? Where the government says, "What are you talking about?" That is what we have had to do. We have had to deal with an issue that is apparent all over the world, seen globally by millions of people, evidence piling up in every manner and every form, documents, testimony, material evidence, and on and on and on. And for the entire 74 years that this has gone on, the policy of the United States government is that, what are you talking about? There's nothing there. There's nothing to be activist about. And if you really think that, you're kind of weird. You get my point here? This is an activist movement like no other in history. And it's gone on for 75 years and it's going to end fairly soon. Ah, so what makes you certain of that? Where is the truth embargo and disclosure as of today? All things end and nothing lasts forever, okay? It's not uncommon for a major activist movement to take 75 to 100 years. This is not uncommon at all. Um, the civil rights movement really doesn't start until after uh, the end of the, 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 the Civil War. Uh, up, to, up till then, I, there were people that certainly wanted to see rights uh, and they wanted to see some just social justice and so forth, but basically they just wanted to end slavery. And that, that, that was a whole nother issue. But once slavery is ended, then the issue of civil rights becomes a, a real issue and, and, and they began to pursue it. And it had a very difficult 100 years, let me tell you. It was a brutal 100 years. And it ended almost exactly 100 years after the Civil War ended. This, this movement is now in its 75th year. 
it is amazing it has lasted this long. But the United States commitment to it was extraordinary. And there were other extraordinary circumstances. But uh, given uh, the evidence that's been amassed, the public awareness that has been generated, the activities of the ETs, which is relentless, uh, it is finally pretty much run out of steam. It, 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 they stopped really invest, investing much into it in terms of new energy, raw energy, around 2000 started kind of backing away, meaning, okay, look, just, just let the momentum carry it forward. And then as time went by, we started making more and more ground, particularly with the media. That's where I came in. My, my principal job was not to lobby members of Congress. They, they wouldn't see me. The best I could do was a 19-year-old intern, but, uh, but lobby the media. Since then, thousands of stories and articles have been written in English language press about this issue, and that's good. But the cumulative effect of all that is that the tooth embargo as policy started breaking down. It just simply started crumbling. And this really gets underway around 2010, 11, 12. The citizen hearing on disclosure was significant. That impacted it quite a bit. Uh, but if I had to pick one thing that started, I guess you could say the, the this end game, this coda mm. for the truth embargoes uh, in that policy, it, it is the Clinton administration and the Rockefeller Initiative. When Rockefeller approached uh, President Clinton and his administration and said, let's get the files out. And this, we're talking about now Bill Clinton when Bill he was president. 1993 to 1996, yeah. And uh, they actually tried. Uh, Rockefeller had the money. He was a very powerful person. He was a major funder of the Democratic National Committee, a friend of the Clintons, and they couldn't tell him no. And so they made an effort. They really made a run at it and it failed. The, 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 the Department of Defense basically told the, the president to go, uh, how can I say this, <laughs> pound sand. Mm. Yeah. And didn't this carry over then when Hillary ran that she was willing to come forward. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and so the reason why I, I say that that was probably really the beginning of the coda is that that area, that time period from 93 to 96 forever connected a very significant political family and their political team to the issue. Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, John Podesta and others were connected. Now the press didn't cover it. And so it didn't get up a lot of exposure until 2000, when the, the documents confirming it all were, were uh, 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 gotten by, by, by a researcher, Grant Cameron, out of Canada, and he gave them to me, and I gave them to the Washington Post, and the Washington Post threw them in the trash. But the point was, is that it just started a process. And as we go forward, the Clinton team had an agenda with respect to this issue, which I think I know. They've never talked about this. But in the intervening years after Clinton leaves office from 2000 forward, one of the key Clinton team, John Podesta, kept keeping the issue alive. He kept feeding it. He would do things, say things, get involved in things connected to the issue. Now, the, the Democrats were not in power. This is the, the Bush administration, 2001 to 2009. Um, but he kept it going. And then she runs for president in 2008. Uh, and I have a feeling I knew exactly what she intended to do. If she won, she was, gonna, she was going to do what her husband couldn't do. She's going to go and get the files. Uh, she didn't talk about it, though. I was working to do what I could to expose that issue. Not expose that issue, but a connector to that issue. But before I could get anything going, she ends up forced out of the uh, process. Uh, she essentially loses the primary race to, uh, to Barack Obama. But nevertheless, the issue is still connected to the Clintons and she didn't go away. She became secretary of state. Podesta became the uh, chairman of, his, uh, of Obama's transition team. Other members of the Clinton family, Clinton team, who knew about the Rockefeller Initiative we're in the government as well, particularly Leon Panetta. And so the issue carries forward, right? And then of course, because the truth embargo was still in place 
as we entered the 2016 election cycle, she ran again. And this time we had the resources and we had the, uh, the press involved that the citizen hearing on disclosure was successful. I went to Capitol Hill, I delivered copies to every single member of Congress. And then I had my public relations person and I hit the press hard and we started generating hundreds of articles during the campaign, which lasted two years, about this connection between this leading candidate for president, Hillary Clinton, and the ET issue. Hundreds of articles, which should have made it a massive story. Mm-hmm. It was a massive story, but it didn't quite get to where I would have liked to go because the, the presidential uh, 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 debate process in the United States is dysfunctional. It's corrupt and dysfunctional and it's a failure. Uh, and so she was able to get through all of the debates and, and forums and so forth. All the candidates were without the issue coming up. This, of course, is an absolute disgrace and black mark on American media, particularly American television journalism. Uh, but so she kind of, but it was okay because she fully intended to disclose. And I knew that. And there were people inside the Department of Defense that knew that and the CIA that knew that. This was a big deal headed our way. Uh, we got a glimpse of it when WikiLeaks dumped all the Democratic uh, emails out, Podesta's emails out. And we learned there were hundreds of emails between Podesta and, and uh, a gentleman by the name of John, uh, uh, not John, but Tom DeLong, and, 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 and interviews that were made and introductions that was actually going on behind the scenes, connected to what was coming, which was Clinton was going to disclose. And so we got a taste of it there, but we didn't get all the details. Anyway, point is she lost. And when she lost, the whole disclosure activist movement was brought to a halt. Boom. Stop cold. Years and years of work essentially was simply shoved aside. And we went into the desert, I guess you could say. Uh, We went into a strange time. And so for the last four years, what we have seen is a lot of chaos, a lot of political turmoil, but yet some major developments regarding the ET issue also did emerge at the same time, which has made the last four years extremely interesting in many ways. And I spend hours talking about that. I don't think you've got many hours, but let me just point out that I can go on for many hours. And, uh, and then it just, and, and just when we thought this is about as interesting as we need it to be, the worst pandemic <laughs> in history, known history of humankind arrives. Now, worst in the sense of how many people were affected, how many people got sick, how many people are dying, how large an area, the entire globe. Nothing like this has ever happened before. This is the worst ever, and it's not done yet. So it's been a rather interesting four years, to say the least. Uh, But the disclosure process has survived, and it's actually made progress, and recently made extraordinary progress. And so, and I'll, and you can ask me about that, and I'll go into greater detail. But the point I'm making is, is that where we are today, is that we are very close to to ending the truth embargo. I believe it's 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 months and it's weeks and months. It may not be more than that uh, to coming to an end. It's pretty much dependent upon the pandemic and any other wars coming to an end or starting up, things like that, which are somewhat consuming. Uh, but for for sure, we're never going backwards. There's never going to be two step one step forward, two steps back. As of 2017, December of 2017, we crossed the Rubicon and it's now straight forward to the finish line. And that finish line is in sight. So that's one way that I describe where we are right now without getting into the minutia. Is it true then in the government that there are committees within committees, that committees don't know what the other committees are doing? There's so much secrecy around this. And that one hand doesn't often know what the other is doing, but one thing that is maintained is that this will not be disclosed. That even though we had what you put were involved in at at the National uh, Press Club, even though we've got these amazing documentaries by people like Dr. Stephen Greer, even though 
we had the disclosure that came about in June of this year that they are still maintaining that, what are you talking about? And the committees don't know about the other government committees? Not exactly, no, no. Some of what you're some of what you're saying applies to part of this last seventy five years. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there are committees within committees. <laughs> you know, that's the Congress. When I mean, you got your committees and you got your subcommittees, you don't think committees. Think stovepipes. The way that the the vast classified world works. Uh, one of the ways it works is. Uh, Agencies often do not know what another agency is doing, though we have tried to correct that since uh, 911. Uh, and so there's that. But then within the agencies, there are stovepipes. In other words, you have a, a very, very, very highly classified uh, area. It's large. And so you may have six different groups working in that area. And in order to maintain security, uh, these groups do not communicate with each other. They have an area they deal in, they deal in that area, and then somebody else gets that information above them and decides what to do about it. This is called stovepiping. It is, it has its advantages and disadvantages. It can be very, very helpful. It can also be extremely dangerous. So the extraterrestrial issue and everything the government knows about it and has done about it is the most highly classified thing in the entire government. Not only our government, but every government of the world. Uh, and so it's heavily stovepiped. However, uh, just because a stovepipe doesn't mean that the truth of Bargo uh, will last forever. No, not at all. There, in a lot of ways that evidence has been gathered, there are many witnesses that have come forward despite the stove piping, uh, many because they retired uh, and they're no longer active, whatever. But there's other evidence, there's plenty of evidence that's amassed independent of what the government could do. And that evidence is enough to confirm the ET presence, all right? That doesn't mean the embargo is going to end. So ultimately, what had to happen is that a sufficient number of people within our government would come to the view that the truth embargo needs to end. There have always been people in our government going all the way back to Roswell that felt that we probably should tell the people right now. 47, 57, 67, 77, 87, whatever. There's always been people that have supported that, but they couldn't carry the day. And there are reasons why they couldn't carry the day. In other words, they could raise their hand and say, the people should know, and they say, put your hand. I get it. That started to change after 2000. And by 2013, when the citizen hearing was held, I like to think maybe we influenced, I think, I know we did, we influenced some of these people. Uh, the number of people inside the military intelligence complex thinking this way had grown to a significant number. Mm -hmm. And what happened is that enough of them decided to take action. Mm -hmm. A dangerous thing to do, by the way. Yeah. And the action that they decided to take, which might have been influenced by the, 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 the citizen hearing on disclosure, but was definitely influenced by the massive press coverage of the connection between the leading candidate to be president, Hillary Clinton, and the ET issue, the UAP ET issue, which was all over the press. Was, I, I have all the articles linked on my website. You can go read all 400 of them. All of this, I think, convinced them it's time to act. And so what did they choose to do? They were very limited. If you're working for the Department of Defense or the CIA or the Navy or the Air Force and you decide to take some personal uh, uh, independent action on an issue like this, you're gonna have a really rough time. You probably will not succeed. You will probably end up in jail uh, and your career will be over. And so they, they, they really couldn't do that. But what they did was brilliant. Working, talking together. This is not a formal policy. This was not an official policy. This was people talking over lunch tables and maybe at, at bars after work over some beers. They came to the idea, why don't we set up a, a, a civilian entity and even a corporation? Because we need to make some money. I mean, we... we we, this is not something you can do without money. 
uh, and uh, we're giving up an awful lot to, 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 to do this. So we, we need to get paid too. set up a corporation and staff it with nothing but former careerists from the military intelligence complex. All of them, every single one of them, retired, no longer active, and therefore able to do things that those inside the military intelligence complex could not do. In other words, they decided to advance disclosure by proxy. And this was a bold thing to try it had many risks, but they had a pretty good plan. And the plan I believe was to put this together and have it ready to go and launch it shortly after Secretary Hillary Clinton became the president elect. Mm -hmm. And then go to the New York Times with major stories, which would have been published before she even got in the White House and then that combined with all the news coverage and the entire history of the connection between Clinton and her political team and the issue sets the stage for disclosure in early 2017. And their exposure would have only lasted probably in that sense for about three months. They probably would have raised $50 million on their public benefit corporation fundraising that they did. And they would have been in the front of the post-disclosure world. It was a genius plan. And it almost worked. So as of the moment that they made the decision to go forward with this plan, at that moment, and I realized this the day they launched in 2017, something was happening that I never thought would ever happen. The military intelligence complex was leading the disclosure advocacy movement by proxy. And that's a whole other ball game, all right? That is, that's someplace we've never been before. And so what happened, of course, is when Hillary Clinton lost the election, everything was blown to hell. And they very well could have simply pulled up the, you know, rolled up sidewalks, shut the windows and gone home. I mean, it, there was way much more risk for them, much more exposure. It's gonna be a huge problem. And they had not been fully exposed. Uh, the plan was only remotely known. It wasn't that well known. And it took them 11 months to make a decision to whether they should go forward or not. And to their enormous credit, there were some personnel changes, but to enormous credit, they decided after 11 months to go ahead and launch anyway. And they launched on November, October the 11th of 2017. Announced their, the people, and uh, put the website up, held a video introduction, and made it quite clear what they intended to do. They intended to end the truth embargo without saying that and to confirm uh, in the proper way the presence of extraterrestrials. Then the question was what would happen next and what happened next was pretty weird. I mean, it, the next couple of years have been almost indescribable politically uh, and they were hung out to dry Mm -hmm. able to raise much money mm -hmm. uh, and they've been through hell however they have persisted and ultimately they achieved what needed to be achieved they got extraordinary news coverage the two new york times article of not articles of, two, of december 16 2017 by helene cooper uh, leslie kane and uh, ralph blumenthal should have been nominated for a pulitzer prize without question were it not for the fact that it dealt with the ET issue, it would have been. But those articles, wow, there was no going back at that point. Since then, witnesses and evidence is simply piling up, waiting for the next step. Mm -hmm. And the next step is clear. Uh, and the stage has been set for that. Uh, we're gonna have congressional hearings with military witnesses, multiple committees they are gonna last for days and days. And those hearings, which will be national security platformed, will provide all the confirmation that anybody in government needs to be able to go in front of the American people and say the ET presence is real. And of course, I'm referring to the president. That's what's coming. And you might say, well, why hasn't that happened already? It, it could have and should have, and I was projecting that it would. 
But we have another thing going on, which not surprisingly is very much the result of human incompetence and stupidity and the laws of the universe, all right? Uh, the worst pandemic in history is underway. And at the point where it looked like we kind of had it under control, mm. it, took, it had taken too long, spread too far, uh, and the policies were too inept that the inevitable mutations began occurring and the Delta variation developed and it's laying waste. And so it's impossible to have hearings under those circumstances. Now there's other things going on like the Afghan situation and of course major bills. Uh, so you take all that together and the hearings that are coming have been pushed back. And at this point, those hearings are pretty much dependent since, since those bills that I referred to will, will be resolved one way or the other fairly soon. The Afghan war is finally ended. The cleanup is underway. That will settle down in a month or so. Um, the only thing really that stands between us and those congressional hearings, which must be held in person, is a stabilization of this, of this pandemic. And that's directly connected to the vaccination level. Now, I know there's a lot of people that are going to hear this and they're just going to start tearing their hair out and, and so forth. I understand. It's okay. I'm not... My, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an extraterrestrial phenomena disclosure activist. I'm not a vaccine activist. However, uh, as, a, as an activist, I have to tell you what I think is going on and what I believe is the case. And I'm saying that there is a pandemic and it's massive and it's affecting the disclosure process and a lot of other things. And if you don't think there's a pandemic, that's okay. If you don't think there's extraterrestrials here, that's okay. History is like an ocean tide. You can't make it go away. You can't talk it away. You can't rationalize it away. It comes in when it comes in. And if you choose to stand out there, it will cover you with water and you will drown. Or maybe not. Maybe the tide will choose just not to come in, just for political reasons. I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to belabor that. I'm just saying that this pandemic is massive and it's, and it's interrupted this process but it, it will not end it. And in fact, I can make a very good case that given what has happened in the last five years, political chaos, turmoil, insurrection, mm -hmm. uh, massive pandemic, you name it, it's all happened and it's all awful. I mean, it's all absolutely awful. And I'm thinking what the world needs right now is something uplifting something mm. forward looking mm. something with implications right yeah okay and disclosures got it all okay you know it's like there's extraterrestrials here they've been here for a long time they're interested in us they have unbelievable technology mm -hmm. we've developed some of that ourselves all of this could change everything let's learn about it Where's the downside? There's, there's not much downside there. We need this badly, right? Anybody that says, no, 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 no. Let's just go through another five or 10 years of awfulness and stupid wars and stupid policies and more pandemics and just everything else you can imagine is really terrible. But let's don't have disclosure of the ET presence because that might upset people. Upset people? And <laughs> not going, <laughs> they can't get more upset. They're as upset as they can get, right? So Steve, why why do you, uh, look, I, I love what Dr. Greer has to say very much, but I'd like to hear your point of view. I understand you haven't met yet an extraterrestrial being from another planet, no. but you clearly know people. You've been very engaged with people at a deep level, sure. with people who have, you've seen the proof. What is your contention? Why? Are they here? What's that important truth? Why do they want to connect? What is this great potential to alter the present course of the human affairs and the human race? Uh, because of the truth embargo and because the extraterrestrials have elected not to sign up for Facebook or Twitter, nobody knows for sure. Uh, we can only look at the history and try to to uh, 
to provide an assessment. And when people say, well, look, if you don't know for sure, keep your mouth shut. Well, this issue is too important to do that. You can't, you can't do that. You get it. Ah, we'll just wait until they shut. No, no, no. This is way too important. And we, this is not unusual. You have, there, a lot of smart people need to, to try to understand this as best they can and make their assessment. Not surprisingly, that doesn't mean they're going to agree. There's plenty of variations of the assessment of the ET presence. Here is what we do know. We know they've been here a long time. We know that they're, the last 74 years has been exceptionally active, without question. We know that that began either intentionally or accidentally or, or uh, unintentionally right after the bombs were dropped on Japan. We know that contact is going on between extraterrestrials and, and individual people, uh, which we call, well, there's some confusion. I call them contactees. There's different kinds of contactees. We know that because there's half a million to a million reports from people about it. They've written it up and sent it in, right, to researchers. Here's what happened to me. Half a million to a million reports. And hundreds and hundreds of them have been interviewed and they're in books and they're in documentaries. We have a mass of evidence about contact. It's happening. It's not something we're going to be dealing with in the hearings. It is one of the most difficult issues of all that the government to address and they will have to address it. But for those of you that are out there having this uh, experience and your closest friends and relatives think you're crazy, I don't. You're not crazy. You're having contact with extraterrestrials. Okay, so we know that's happening. We know what they look like because many of the contactees have, have, have drawn them and painted them. Because if you, if, you, if you contact enough humans, some of them are actually pretty good at drawing and painting. We know what happens to many of these contactees because they report it. So we know that. We know that they put crop circles down in UK fields on a every year for decades now. We know that they harvest material from animals. Uh, it's called animal, cattle mutilation. But I call it animal harvesting, whatever. We know they do that. Okay. Uh, and that's all pretty interesting. And, and, and there's a lot of information there that one could, and I could go in further if you want, but from that information, you could kind of speculate it's some, why they're here. But there's one thing above all that we know about extraterrestrials, which is the most important. And that is that they have repeatedly flown their craft, either piloted or remotely, hovered that craft over nuclear weapon sites. Correct. Right. Missiles off. Right. Mm. And is the most important thing of all. Mm -hmm. Have eyewitnesses to that in the UK? I'm sorry, in the United States, we have eyewitnesses to that that have come forward in Soviet Union in Russia. There's at least one known nuclear weapons tampering incident in the UK. That is, of course, the Rendlesham Forest incident. There may be some others. I know of no, no evidence regarding the same thing in China, but China wouldn't tell us if it happened anyway. Uh, but the two major nuclear powers are the Soviet Union, Russia, and the United States. That's what matters. Not only do we have direct evidence from wit high witnesses that they have turned the weapons off, we have direct evidence they have turned them on. They turned them on, meaning they set them into launch sequence. Now you're thinking, why hasn't that been on the New York Times front page 20 or 30 times? That is a very good question that one day I hope to ask the editors and publishers of the New York Times. I'm sure they'll have a very snappy answer for that. Why haven't any of the nuclear weapons tampering witnesses, there are scores of them, testified in front of the United States Congress or the UK Parliament or the Canadian Parliament? That's an interesting question I'm going to ask. The US government's policy about these witnesses is they don't exist. They do not respond, they do nothing. They just hope they'll go away and they don't go away, though they are starting to die off. And why is that? The government can push back when it wants to. But how do you push back against men, almost all men, I think there's a woman or two, mostly men, particularly in the nuclear weapons issue, that were cleared at the highest level of security to run a nuclear site 
Mm. If we had the power to key with a, another individual in that site and launch nuclear missiles, which would have ended civilization, and you've got scores of them, how are you going to push back against them? Are you going to call them all crazy or playing a practical joke? You can't. You just can't even talk to them. You must have to pretend they don't exist. And this is the kind of thing the government has had to do, which is so transparently and ludicrously stupid that many in the government have decided enough is enough. How long can we treat our own military this way? How long can we lie to the American people this way? This needs to end. And so we know that now. Why are they turning our nuclear weapons off? I lecture on this and I have a lot more to say about it in the future, but there's only a couple of possibilities. This is a direct threat to us that you're going to do what we want you to do when we want you to do it at a time of our choosing and there's not a damn thing you can do about it, okay? That's one possibility. And there is another possibility. Why do you have these weapons? Okay. Do you have them because you think they're gonna protect you against us? No, it won't work. Do you have them because you want to just, you want to literally be able to destroy your entire civilization, which has taken 5 billion years to achieve? Why would you do that? That's kind of stupid, right? Do you, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you keep these weapons and keep building these weapons because you'd much rather spend trillions of dollars on nuclear submarines and nuclear aircraft carriers and nuclear weapons instead of on social justice and financial equality so that you have billions of people in the world that are inadequately housed and clothed and are desperate and poor and ready to blow themselves up in order to point that out to you, at least those of you that have so much. Why do you have these weapons? Now, I happen to know that the majority of the witnesses to these events, still living, have already come to a conclusion on this. In the majority, they believe it's a message, not a threat. The ones that went through it, that were on the base that day when the missiles were shut down, believe it was a message and not a threat. So if that is the message, why do you give that message at all? Why would you care whether we use them or don't use them? We can't hurt them. We can't do a thing to them. And that is the $64,000 question. And every, different people have different answers to that. My answer is fairly straightforward. They, uh, one, believe that destruction of our civilization is a stupid, wasteful thing to happen and shouldn't happen. Two, they are, to a degree that they choose, intervening to possibly prevent that from happening. That doesn't mean they would stop it, it just means that they're intervening, right? This intervention has helped to drive the disclosure process, I assure you. All those millions of sightings certainly didn't slow the disclosure process down. Also, turning off those nukes didn't disclose the, the, uh, the slow the disclosure process down either. In fact, it's made the, it, it is the fundamental platform in which the hearings will be held. So it appears that they would like to, they don't have a problem with us disclosing, of, of acknowledging their presence. Why would they not care if we, why, why would it matter to them that we disclosed, right? There has to be a reason. If, if they're actually helping it happen, why? Because once you have disclosure, then the world is informed of the ET presence. And you know what the world's going to do when that happens? It's going to go to school. We're going to go fully autodidact. And everybody, to one degree or another, is going to start learning everything they can about the extraterrestrials, what the government knows, what the researchers have found out, all the books, all the docs, everything. Going to look at all of them going to demand information from every government in the world, going to get some of that information. And it's going to be ET all the time, 24 and 7. And you're literally going to see a learning curve like this straight up 
okay, around the world, thanks to cell phones, Facebook, internet, and all of that, right? Everybody can learn together in real time. And after about two years, we'll be pretty comfortable with the idea, even bored, bored with the idea. Yeah, there's ETs here. We've learned a lot. Okay. Then open contact can take place. Mm. Non-destructive open contact, right? They could have ended this truth embargo anytime they wanted to. We know that. We make movies about that. Why didn't they? Obviously, they must believe there is appropriate time for that. Now, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to give you an assessment based on relatively basic logic. I'm not trying to stretch things too far. Just simple logic, like Nancy Drew mysteries. Well, you know, during your career, Steve, you worked on some pretty complex issues like former Area 51 employees, like statements, stories made by astronaut Edgar Mitchell, you know, yeah. Apollo 14, government cover-ups and all of that. So these claims you're talking about and the revelations that are kept from the public, this has been going on a really long time. Yes. Absolutely. Sure. Just like the civil rights abuses and segregation and racism went on for a very long time. And so why did it end? Now, racism hasn't ended, but why did the, the policies of legal segregation in this country come to an end after when it had been around for so long? It, I, I, you are so much younger than I you probably don't recall this, but I, I was there uh, as the civil rights movement was moving towards its prize, the Civil Rights Act mm -hmm. and the Voting Rights Act. Even up until the last months, there were intellectuals in this country, not racist intellectuals, but rather just intellectuals, even intellectuals of color who felt that forcing this issue, pushing so hard, getting hosed down by fire hoses and bitten by German shepherds and all that, and just causing all that fuss was not the way to go. That we needed to let the South organically grow out of, and any other communities or states, or grammatic, organically grow out of segregation to integration, that it would come in its own good time, all right? Well, the movement disagreed. I certainly disagreed, right? And there are people today that believe that, look, don't even think about it. It'll happen when it happens. Why are you pressing? Mm, well, this is where it gets interesting. It's lasted for 75 years. A lot has happened. A lot of people's minds have changed. They just did a Gallup poll about five days ago. The numbers haven't changed since 1970. 41% of the American adult population, 106 million people believe that some of the ph phenomena that we've been seeing is extraterrestrial in origin. That's 106 million Americans. And probably of the 100 and, and I think 30 other million, probably a third of those are kind of like probably on the fence. All right, maybe even a half are on the fence. Maybe I, I, it could very well be, I don't know. This is a massive number of people, all right? But there's something else. And this is part of my work. I mean, I've been driving this, this point forward for 20 years. I'll be as simple as I can here. Because an awful lot of people, particularly younger people, don't understand this. They don't get it. They see the world as it is. It seems to be fine. What's the problem? Here is the problem. Since 1947, but really since the mid-1950s, but 47 is kind of the year. We have been in what is called a nuclear arms race. Mm -hmm. It didn't end with the end of the Cold War, I can assure you. And mm -hmm. in fact, we have been in Cold War II for some time. Mm -hmm. At the peak, we had 80 four, five, six thousand nuclear warheads, uh, nuclear warheads, uh, thousands of which were on immediate launch capability in eight countries. We've nearly had nuclear launches on about six occasions, maybe more. 
we came that close on four or five, six occasions, which means we came that close to the end of civilization. And there are people out there that go, well, hey, you know, hey, great. Obviously, we are, we're really very lucky. So let's take all the money we've made and push it back out on the table and go for broke. The truth is, the odds that we are here today are actually low. Mm. We had a nuclear war, that we dodged them. If you actually knew, if somebody really wants to uh, uh, cause heartburn, and this has not been done yet, but there have been bits and pieces. They need to do a documentary exclusively on every instance where we almost had nuclear launches mm -hmm. so that people can get it in their head that they have been dancing on the volcano for 75 years and eventually they're going to fall in. And all of your hopes and dreams and aspirations for you and your kids and your grandkids and for the planet will all just go up in radioactive smoke. We have pressed our luck way too far. We have given, we have had awful politics. We have made incredibly stupid decisions. We have, re, re, we have continued to act on our most grounded, fundamental animal instincts. We still have 25,000 nuclear weapons. We're building more, we're building them bigger, faster, and we're going to soon put them in space. We don't have much, many, many more years. If we do not resolve this issue, we will not survive the 21st century. We won't even probably survive the 2050. Um, let me state that again. For all of you out there that feel your life is going really well and everything is just fine, and the politics is actually pretty good depending upon which party you're in. And you know, there's a lot of poor people out there and a lot of crises, but it's okay, it's all gonna work out. You are living in dreamland. We are on the edge of a nuclear war every single day. And in addition, to where we were in 1985, when we had 86,000 nuclear weapons in eight countries, we now have dozens of NGOs, or no, I'm sorry, NSOs, non-state operators, any one of which, if they could get a nuclear weapon, would use it. Think about that. Sobering, yeah. And so if we don't, if we don't change things, Forget global warming. We, you, you don't have to worry about drowning in, in the rising sea levels. You will be a pile of radioactive ash long before then. We have to take action. Are we doing it? How many politicians in the last presidential election discussed this? Zero. Mm. How many articles have been on the front page of the New York Times the last four? Zero. How many people are really addressing it now? Zero. It comes up once in a while. You know, Steve, I yeah. worked at. Can I see why this is important and not just another. Can you say so. Oh. Yes. Okay. Very That's sobering what you just shared. You know, I worked at NASA at Jet Propulsion Laboratory for really? a period. Yes, for a period of time. And I was there. I was there when they started to lose their funding. And I was there in the meetings with the director of JPL. I never talk about this, but this just feels really important. Share with me. Yeah. When the director stood up and said, you know, basically we're losing our funding and, you know, it's going to be attrition. It's going to be layoffs. It's, it's bleak. We don't have a big career for unmanned. That's our term for what we put out unmanned spacecraft at this point. And we had a little shaky record at the time. And what we were told, and I fully understood what I was being told, was in order to keep us afloat and give everybody jobs, the government slash military is now going to get involved. And there is going to be some changes in departments and probably people who were working. I mean, these amazing people whose dream was astronomy. And here they were doing it and being told they're going to be pulled and basically you can work for the military and probably start creating weapons. And that's where our funding is going to come from. The so the program uh, started to expand mm -hmm. and, and provide jobs and the secret space program exists. The Space Force is a joke, but whatever, it's a political toy and, and uh, it was a pathetic thing. But nevertheless, uh, uh, there is a, a secret space program and that's fine, a classified space program. I say it's fine, I mean, it's normal. 
Uh, and yes, there are plenty of people that want to put weapons in space and they're going to try very, very hard. And all that means is that the risk of us, uh, the chances of us getting through the century just get even lower. And so the, the point that ultimately I, I try to drive home every, every time I speak is this. Based upon standard political policies, thinking, history, there's no way out of this. We can't, we can't, we can't get out of this. The United States thinks it's so powerful that it can do anything. It couldn't beat the Taliban. Mm. Probably shouldn't have beaten the Taliban. The point is, and I could go on and on and on. We cannot get out of this. We cannot get out of this. There will be a nuclear war unless there is a deus ex machina. Mm. Mm. A very, very useful tool, particularly in um, uh, theater in the Middle Ages. Right. Now, when I say Deus Ex Machina, I do not mean God. I am no. a secular man, so I'm not looking there. But Deus Ex Machina, for those that just never took Latin, it means God in the machine. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about those ETs, <laughs> the ones that accelerated their activity here after the bombs were dropped in Japan, the ones that have been turning off on the weapons, the ones that have technology that could provide solutions to a great deal of some of the worst of our problems and solving some of the worst of our problems would help to minimize uh, the risk of nuclear war. Because when people have enough food and clothing and water, they're less likely to sign up to the closest non-state organization and try to go blow themselves up. Mm -hmm. But it gets better than that, right? I say it gets better than that. Here is my whole card. Okay. This is the one I'm going to continue to play. Mm -hmm. And people are going to go, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just guessing. Yeah, you're right. I'm guessing, but I like this guess. I'm fond of this guess. I believe that all of this activity for 75 years is leading to disclosure and disclosure is leading to open contact, two years roughly. And when open contact takes place, Open contact means they're talking to CNN and we're getting the transcripts. You know what I'm talking about here? Mm -hmm. One of them will turn up on your show. That would be cool. A Zoom, Debbie and an ET, big audience, whatever. The point is we're talking about open contact. Well, well if you're going to have open contact, what are you going to say? Are you going to make small talk? This is what I think they're going to say. They're going to say, okay, you know we're here. We've been dealing with individuals. We have reasons for that. But now we're dealing with you as a global civilization. You want to come and play with us? You want to be part of our alliance, I guess you could say? You got to get rid of the news. You can't, you can't play with us if you don't have the news. And by the way, we are well aware of your physics and its progress. We are well aware that you are very close to figuring out the workaround to, to, to uh, relativity that allows you to get from one star to another, not in uh, 500 years, but in three weeks. Mm -hmm. We're closing in on that in our physics. Uh, <laughs> check it out if you don't believe me. It's on the internet, right? Uh, are we there yet? No. We spent years trying to find the Hig Higgs boson and people said there is no such boson until we found the damn thing. So yeah, so what happens if we get the workaround? We're going to build ships that can go to the stars. Everybody's dreamed about that. And given where we are in our evolution, spiritual or consciousness, whatever you want to call it, if we're going to go out into the galaxy in our interstellar ships, we need to be safe, right? So naturally, we're going to have to take some nukes along. Right? Everybody's seen Star, Star Trek and Star Wars and all that shit, right? They're like Westerns. They just they're from close distance, which is completely ridiculous, but what the hell? The point is that we're taking nukes with us. Now, if let me and let me just kind of turn that around just for a second. Imagine if we built those starships and we and we went out, went up to the well, portals. I just want to intervene. I you know portals is a thing too, multi-dimensional, linear time, not linear time. About to build interstellar ships, which is exactly what's happened here, and we saw that. What do you think we would do? 
Do you think we would just head on back to Earth and, and, and hope that they didn't find out where we were? What do you think we would do? We would intervene. And that's what the ETs are doing, I believe. They're basically intervening. In other words, look, you can't hurt us. But if you build interstellar ships and put nukes on them, which we know you will, and you head on out, you could hurt us. You could come at us from any angle. You could turn up anywhere. And that isn't going to happen. We're already here. We already know. You're not leaving this solar system with a nuke, period. So if you want to keep your nukes, you can't play with us. We'll hang around, but we're not, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna give you jack. Uh, and if you put a nuke on a starship, we'll blow it up. You're not leaving. Now that would be the quarantine that everybody's fond of. There's always been this, we've been quarantined, we've been quarantined. Not exactly. But if we build starships, yeah, we're gonna be quarantined. So we're gonna be, it's gonna be a demand from these ETs that have been dealing with us so intensely, you give up the nukes. And that will be an interesting political discussion. That's going to go on for a while. That's going to be fascinating. I'm, I hope to God I'm, I'm, I'm alive to watch this. Mm. It's those who defend we have to keep the nukes to those that say, hey, it's time to get rid of the nukes. And if we get rid of the nukes, then we get to engage the ETs. We get possibly access to extraordinary technology, and we can go to the stars. If we don't get rid of the nukes, we can just sit here and, and, and boil in our own oil. They won't care ultimately. I think ultimately they won't care. It's like if you're that stupid that knowing now you're not alone, you still want to build nukes and threaten each other with them. Well, then you we don't need you. The galaxy can live without you. So what's going on, Debbie, is that we are approaching the most profound event in human history, the most profound transition in human history, and virtually a deadline as to whether we're going to continue as a civilization. That's all, just that. That's what's going down. And then people ask me, Steve, why are you so passionate about this? What can I say? How can you not be? You have an upcoming live workshop at the Conscious Life Expo in LA. It's called yeah. Disclosure, the End Game. Oh, no, that's my 45. But then there's a three hour, uh, three hour uh, uh, panel with Danny Shan and me and Whitley Straber. Oh, that is a trifecta. Great. That's beautiful. This is the Conscious Life Expo. They're, it's amazing what they're doing. They're doing two live uh, events, one in London at Hilton and one in LA, uh, Los Angeles, the LAX Hilton, and an online at the same time, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming, every, well, I'm pretty sure everybody will be wearing masks in the LA Hilton if they've done sure. oh, They're taking uh, precautions, yeah. And so it's it's they really they've, they've really made an effort to keep their their conference alive and also to provide something different but uh oh yeah it's going to be me and whitley and uh and danny Chan, and i can tell you that's for 20 minutes or an hour three hours and the, the all three of us are how would you say quite good at speaking very good at speaking <laughs> that's speaking our mind. So it's going to be fascinating. And so I hope people who can come safely to the LA Hilton will come see us. Yes. And uh, otherwise, and, and I think eventually all of this will be archived. In addition to the online live, I'm sure all of the, the live performances will be archived online and can be seen later. Beautiful. And I want folks to know, because yeah, this is a major trifecta. Whitley has been on the show three times. You, this is, I'm going to say, very prophetically, this is your first time because you are so welcome back. And uh, Danny Sheehan is next week. So profound, what, what a group. And so for folks who are interested, ConsciousLifeExpo.com, make sure you're looking at the 2021 program. I do give them huge kudos for stepping up during this time. They, I know they're setting it up very safely for everybody. And I know the cast of characters who are going to be there to speak and the experts, and it's really worth it. For those who may be in another country or in a situation where for whatever reason you can't go in person, in person is what I recommend, but you can also live stream it. So it's available for you. Their agenda is also online. You can see where Steve is speaking and when he's speaking, so you can make sure to attend that. Highly recommended. And Steve, this is Dare to Dream. So what are you next, Dare to Dream? I, I have one dream, 
and that is the day the President of the United States walks out to the end of Cross Hall in the East Wing, stands in front of that podium with all those flags behind him, and 200 press. I've been in that room. I have sat in that same exact place. And confirms to the world, as the first head of state to do so, which is possible, that we're not alone and that we have visitors now, and we're going to address that together. That's my dream. I, I don't dare to dream for anything else because that is an awful lot to dream. For folks who are interested in more about Steve Bassett, go to paradigmresearchgroup.org. Steve, I thank you so much for coming on today and for everything you shared. This was illuminating. Thank you. And I end today's show with this quote from Mehmet Murat Ildan. To think that there is no life outside of the world is actually an extremely sick thought, a disease. So what is the disease? Ego. Our existence is very special. Our existence is a miracle. And to imagine that there cannot be such a miracle elsewhere, hmm, this is an ego, a huge problematic ego. Subscribe to the Dare to Dream podcast to hear this weekly number one transformation conversation. My guest next week is Daniel Sheehan, who has been the constitutional trial lawyer in Pentagon Papers, Silkwood, Iran-Contra, and no DAPL cases. He is the counsel for Romero Institute and Lakota Law. Also, something that was mentioned today that's very interesting that we'll be talking about next week, the 2017 DOD case of Luis Elizondo, a DOD employee who dared to speak out. So we will be talking about that. And he is also widely seen in the Stephen Greer documentaries. Do subscribe. If you're listening to the podcast, you want to see what we look like, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. And remember, folks, this is a big dream you heard today. I am right there. I have seen craft myself in the last year on two different occasions. I engage regularly in contact work. And um, this is my conversation. My show has changed over the last few years because this is my heart's calling. So join us in this and, and in Steve's lobbyist, beautiful fight and voice, voice for the voiceless, really, and what he's doing, support us in what this is and continue to dream and create all your dreams.